My name is Josh Katz. I'm a graphics editor at the New York Times. Um, it's true, I made the dialect quiz, and I'm not going to talk about it at all. So, and also, I realize that I'm the last person standing between you and drinks, so I'll try to make this as quick as I can. So the graphics department is a collection of about 40 people. It's this eclectic mix of coders and artists and cartographers and web developers and some people like myself who are formally trained in statistics. Um, so for me, so this is a sample of some of the work I've done over the past couple of years. And I have pretty much used R at some point for all of it. Um, just to run through some examples of where R played a larger role or some of the different things we've used it for. We used it for uh, text analysis. So this looked at the speeches of different Republican primary candidates. Or no, their debate performances. Looked at the debate performances of different Republican primary candidates and compared them in a sort of used semantic analysis to compare the way that they spoke with works of literature to find out that uh, Ted Cruz speaks kind of like Beowulf and Donald Trump speaks kind of like the legends of King Arthur and et cetera. Um, the other thing, so this was sort of the same idea as the dialect quiz. The dialect quiz was really an exercise in spatial smoothing. Uh, it was taking, we had point data of survey responses and then smoothing it out to get this continuous gradient. And we used the same idea to make this series of Facebook fan maps, so based on people's where which uh, team pages they had liked and where they were from. We constructed these maps of where different teams' fan bases were. So this one was for college football. And then another thing is just like a straight up stats 101, looking at the correlation between different variables. So this was taking support for Donald Trump and comparing it to a bunch of different demographic and economic variables to find that places where there are a large number of uh, poorly educated white people or people who I reported their ancestry as American or there were a large number of mobile homes tended to vote uh, in greater proportion for Donald Trump. And so with my colleague, Neil Irwin, uh, we wrote an article just kind of looking at places like this and why Trump's message might resonate more in places like that. And so it's sort of using statistics in this case, it wasn't a data visualization. It was just using it to sort of construct this story and tell a story about Trump's message and these certain areas of the country. The other thing that we've been using a lot for lately, I don't know if you've seen these, we've been running these live primary forecasts. So as the vote is coming in, we're adjusting for where we have the vote already, like where we're expecting more votes to come in from. And based on the demographics of those places, we sort of adjust to what we think the vote is going to be at the end of the night. So this was the most recent primary in Wisconsin. Um, the area around Milwaukee, the vote from there came in first, very early in the night, and which we knew was just based on demographics tilted more towards Cruz than Trump. So we were able to, like if you see at the very edge of that graph, um, when the first votes came in, it showed Cruz up by like 25 points. And we were like, no, we think it's more like 13 or 14. And that's kind of where it ended up being. And the last, so this is not my work. This is uh, by two colleagues of mine, Gregor Eich and Josh Keller, looked at monthly gun sales. And you can see there's this seasonal pattern to it. And once you take that out, you can see this other pattern emerge, which is gun sales spiked when President Obama was elected in 2008, and in 2012, there was this spike in gun sales. And we also showed that we were in the midst of another spike now. And then the last thing, oh, and I should mention that that is also an R package now called gun sales, which you can get on CRAM, so <laughs> just so you know. But, other than you know, gun sales, the, thing that, the much more important thing that we use R for is whether coaches are making the right decisions on fourth down. So whether it's right to punt or go for it or kick a field goal. Um, so this is this, it's this pretty big convoluted project that involves a lot of different moving parts. It has 
you know, we have to talk to the NFL API to get play-by-play -play data, and then it sends out uh, part of it's written in Python. Um, and there is a part of it that was also in R. So the bulk of it is running in Node, which is a sort of server-side JavaScript. Um, and so that's what's bringing in the play-by-play -play data. And what I wanted to do, because I had these scripts running in R for analyzing that data, that I really did not feel like learning how to recode in JavaScript. So I, instead, I thought, all right, well, I'll just write a little module to take the data that I have in JavaScript, send it to R, and then have R send it back to that JavaScript code when it's done. And from that need came this little node module called RScript. Um, so I don't know, what is people's familiarity with Node? How often do you people, um, kind of, ish? All right, close enough. So the basic idea is, so you're starting in JavaScript. This is a JavaScript module. And what it does is, if you see on the left, it sends, you pass it data, it sends it to R, and then it just, the final output from your R script, it sends it back to JavaScript. It's a relatively simple process. It just makes my workflow easier. And it means I can do more in R, uh, which I would rather be doing anyway. And so this is an example of an, so the last one, this is a synchronous method. And this one's asynchronous. And you can pass all different types of data that can be named variables. Uh, you can do whatever you want. It's just to make life easier. And around the same time, I started incorporating R into make files. So if you're not familiar with make, it's sort of this automated build process. Uh, so a, one example that we used it for was this. So this is looking at travel patterns on Thanksgiving, so where people are flying for Thanksgiving. And this started as just a CSV from Google Flights. Uh, that was where it started. And then I pulled that into R kind of reshape it, analyze it, um, and then send that to Node where we run some layout algorithms on it, which takes some time, and then send that. That output is what is pulled into the browser to make the graphic. So that all of the processing stuff is happening server side, so it's not happening in the browser. Uh, and a make file is something that just automates that entire process. So if I want to change one thing, one way of looking at the data in R, I can do that, and then it will just rerun everything from scratch. So I was really excited about these two new tools I had for working with R, both R script and incorporating it into the make files. So I was thinking, what could go wrong? This is great. <laughs> that was a metaphor for my experience. So what I ran into extremely quickly was errors for missing packages. <clears throat> because, as I said, in the graphics department, there's about 40 of us. And we are, it's a very collaborative team. We are working on each other's stuff all the time. And a lot of the people I work with um, might not be might not have a strong coding background. They might not use R at all. Um, so these scripts, if they had to make a change to the graphic or change something about it, the, that code needed to be able to run on their computer. And ideally, in order to you know, play nicely with others, it should be able to run without them having to go in and open up R and install packages because they might not you know, if I go over to their computer, I'm like, oh, yeah, you need to install this program and do all these things. It would cause problems, these kinds of problems. And so that led me to develop <coughs> needs. What needs is, is it's an R package. All it is is a simple wrapper around two functions, library and install.packages. And it just loads, it loads packages and just installs any that are missing. So initially, I had this whole kind of screen cap of that process. But now that I know I have access to R, I can just show you how it works. All right. 
So to start off with, we can just remove all of these packages so they're not there. Yes. Maybe. How's that? All right. So if you tried to run this, you get errors. That's no good. Needs. Just installs them slowly. And then it works. And that's it. Um, so it's this really simple idea, but it allowed me to use R both in R script and in a make file without having to worry about other people needing to install packages. Um, it also had some, I figured since I was writing this, I might as well let it do things that I had always wanted library to do, which is you can't do this in library. That won't work. But in needs, it does. Uh, right, so this doesn't work. But this does. So that's nice. Other things, just as a fun bonus, I figured I would add this prioritize function. So if you know, I mean, if you've used dplyr and plyr, you know that they do not get along well with each other um, because their functions overlap. So if you load plyr after dplyr, it masks all of these functions. And all of these. So then if you do something like this, it gives you the wrong answer. So I made this prioritize function within the needs package, which just moves dplyr ahead to the front of the search path. So whatever, and it doesn't have to be dplyr, obviously, it's whatever package you put here will just get moved to the front of the search path so that when R goes and finds, say, group by and summarize, it finds the one in dplyr. So you can do this and see now all of these functions are coming from dplyr instead of from plyr. And that is the extent of my talk. So thanks for hearing me.